first of all, um, that's not sunshine and 80 degree weather out there. So I, I just got here and it's really kind of miserable. So you really probably would rather be here than outside. Um, but I will try to be somewhat to the point so that you don't, because I know this has been a, a good long day for you. And, uh, but I'd like you to have some information from me that, that I found important for myself to try to, in, in trying to uh, uh, treat my patients. And so uh, hopefully this, this will have some benefit to you as well. Um, so the question on, on, on my uh, title here is uh, augmentation techniques, are they necessary? You know, in orthopedics, um, the, there's, in, in any field, there's always these uh, kind of bandwagon types of situations where things become very popular and everybody tries to, that everybody jumps on them and they think, oh, this is the, the best thing since sliced bread. But you, try to, but you try to sort these things out and you try to decide, is this, is this, are these things really uh, what, they're, what they claim to be or, or are they uh, just a, a flash in the pan and something that's going to be gone in, you know, in, the, in the next year or two years or, or find out that it wasn't really so good and maybe it was more bad than good. So um, that's why this, this topic came to mind. It also, um, I had started preparing this talk last year, about a year ago, uh, for a seminar that was going to be given in the summer last year, and, and that was canceled, so that I put this back up on the shelf, and, and then I took it off and dusted it off a little bit this spring, and then realized that I still hadn't answered the question for myself. And so, I, so I've been doing some more reading and, uh, and, and also just evaluating what's, what's uh, currently going on in the, in the marketplace and in the uh, orthopedic world. Now, hopefully I hit the right buttons here, so I'll do my best. So... As a, as a physician, we love, especially as an orthopedic surgeon, we love new toys. Um, this is the only toy actually I could find in my house since my daughters are all grown up. And, and uh, they, there's lots of hor plastic horses around, but there wasn't a lot of other things. But um, we love toys. We love new things. Um, and um, so when we get enthusiastic about these things and something new and saying, oh, this is, this is going to be this is going to be great. This is going to make your outcomes uh, so much better. We start to we we we're tempted to use them right away, and the um, uh, but the the reality is is that they don't always pan out the way they the way you think they're going to be. We don't we don't like we, as uh, we don't like our enthusiasm to be tempered by controlled studies. But at the end of the day, we need to do, we need to do that, um, and so um, sometimes we we some, we sometimes get ahead of ourselves in our pursuit of of using these toys. So. Why is the question asked in the first place that, you know, the, the primary problem, you look at rotator cuff tears and, their, and then repairs, they, they don't always come out as well as you think they might. And uh, in these numbers that are presented here, even in small tears, small to medium tears, involving only the supraspinatus tendon or a single tendon, which is the most common one, uh, you still have a 10 to 20 percent uh, failure rate. And then with even larger tears, which are not uncommon, you'll have a uh, 40% uh, failure rate. And then when you have the, these tears that are uh, you know, retracted to, to the level of the glenoid, they oftentimes, more than two thirds of them fail, they even, he, even heal. Um, so, so there is a need for, to do something different and that's what, that's what prompts a lot of the things that go on in, in the, in the uh, orthopedic uh, field. Um, factors that are predictive for failure of repairs, uh, one, the size of the tear, Second, the extent of the retraction of the tear. And then third is muscle degeneration. The first two go hand in hand. And so usually the, the larger the tear, the more the retraction. But uh, that's not always the case. Sometimes the, you can have two tendon tear uh, across where the attachment is to the, to the humeral head. But you, may not, but you may not have any much retraction, uh, though the, a great deal of the time uh, the retraction is going to be dependent upon a, a, a large tear. And then the other factor is mar muscle degeneration. It doesn't matter how, you know, how, much, how good your repair is or how um, uh, uh, small a tear is. If the, if the muscle's not working, if, the, if there's atrophy, and uh, either for neurological reasons or for just for uh, disuse reasons, uh, repairing the cuff isn't going to solve the problem because the cuff needs to be functioning not only as a, as a tendon attachment but also as a functional muscle because if the deltoid fires and the, and, the, and the rotator cuff doesn't or doesn't do it well, then you're just going to have abnormal stresses in the, in the cuff. The, the, tendon, the tendon repair is going to fail anyways. 
So size of tears, um, this is just an example of a, um, of the, of a articular side tear. You can see the, the um, this, I should get my pointer out here. So in this particular situation, this is the supraspinatus. You can see the biceps tendon here in the front of the shoulder. All of these pictures are typically taken from the back of the shoulder looking forward because that's usually the, uh, the uh, portal that we use for our placement of the arthroscope. Um, this is the biceps tendon that actually is a very healthy looking tendon. The humeral head looks very good. The cartilage looks very good. Uh, this is just a, a metal probe that's in there. But there is a tearing and a fraying of the cuff here. Uh, this, is, this would be considered a partial tear in, in, under, in an undersurface or articular side tear. Um, the extent of retraction, this is now on the top side of the tendon. This is up here is where your acromion is or the, or the uh, deltoid attachments. Uh, this is a probe. This is a suture that was placed to identify where the tear was from the undersurface. But this is the, down here is the bone. Up here is the tendon, and this is the monoretraction, which in this particular case is fairly small. So muscle atrophy, these, these things can be determined usually by uh, just a clinical examination. Look at the back of the patient's shoulder. The uh, top part of the scapula should usually have some fullness to it. If it has a depression, it's an indication that the muscle is atrophied. Uh, but you also can uh, identify this on MRI findings as well. So once you decide, you determine that there is a rotator cuff tear, there's a certain number of steps that need to be taken into account to, uh, in, in, your, in uh, planning what to do. First of all, preoperative planning. Not only um, do you have to um, know that there is a tear there, but you should, you should recognize the, the size of the tear. You should recognize, like so you mentioned, the, the amount of retraction, atrophy of the muscles. And then also you need to look at comorbidities. Uh, does the patient hit diabetic? Are they, uh, are they, do they have hypothyroidism? Do they have other medical problems, peripheral vascular disease that may compromise their healing ability? And then also you need to look at their social history and, and uh, whether they're a smoker, alcoholic beverage use, uh, that type of thing. But once you've done the pre-op plan planning, then you, can, then, you need to, then you need to decide as individually, okay, what surgical implants do I, am I going to need for the repair? Uh, can, I, can, I just do, can I do a simple repair or is this need to, can need to be a reconstruction of some sort? Um, tissue augmentation, if you're, gonna, if you're thinking that it's a large tear and you're, you're going to need to be using some sort of tissue augmentation, you obviously need to have made the arrangements to have it available. You need to decide what kind is best for the, for the uh, patient. And then uh, platelet-rich enriched plasma, that's one of the things that's been used a lot uh, recently and it's one, some I'll get to in a, in a little bit, but if, if you're going to be using it or thinking about using it, you need to obviously have it available. Uh, some of the risk factors for failure we've already talked about, um, age of patients. Um, and it, it's surprising, though. You can have a 60-year-old and 80-year-old, and the 80-year-old will heal like, like, uh, like it's magic, and 60-year-old will struggle, and, and you go figure... But it's uh, just, you know, it's genetics. And uh, whenever I tell people, you know, what, you know, what percentage is, uh, is, is, is going to be the, the injury and what percent genetics, it's usually somewhere of 20, 30 percent the injury and 80, 70, 80 percent the genetics because some people heal better than others. And that's just, you know, just the, the way it is. Um, the systemic conditions we talked about, uh, diabetes and such, social habits, occupation. The occupation doesn't have so much to do with the failure of it to heal, but it obviously has a big factor in, in whether they're going to get back to their, to their job or whether they have a high risk of recurrence of the problem. Because again, if they are going back to, heavy, to, to very heavy work, and uh, this kind of reminds you of a, a patient I've had recently who is a, a, a stonemason. Well, he's, he's in his uh, late 50s, early 60s, around that, that age, he has to lift these 80 pound blocks to shoulder level. You know, I guarantee you that, and we've, we've had our long talk with him that you, this may not work. You may, you know, he, he does part time as a, as a, as a uh, you know, site manager or as a, uh, you know, the overseer of, of things, but he also has to lay block at times. And, and so it's a difficult situation when you have, when your occupation requires you to do these things. And, and as he said, it's difficult for him to tell, tell everybody in, uh, who he's working with to raise the scaffolding higher every, when, when they're still working at, you know, at a comfortable level. And he has, you know, he has to be working at a level that, he, that he's having difficulties uh, getting his arm up that high. So the occupations have an effect on both on, their, on the, re -rate, the rate of re-rupture and also on even getting back to work. History of injuries important in that 
you know, if it's a if it's a slight injury or mild injury, uh, oftentimes it's a that's a and, there, yet, and yet there is a rotator cuff tear. That's a, an example. Uh, that's an indicator that there's probably some pre-existing uh, disease there. And, and when there is pre-existing disease, you need to realize then that's probably been there for quite a while, and therefore the quality of the tendon, quality of the muscle, and, and a number of other factors may be compromised. And you need to and it, you need and as a physician you need to be aware of that because it's going to affect the outcomes. Um, Physical exam we talked about a little bit, and then uh, knowing, uh, looking at radiographic findings and, and MRI findings to, to also be able to plan uh, what, uh, what's going to need to be done at time of surgery. Um, this radiographic exam, uh, this is actually a pretty healthy looking shoulder. There's a minor little um, uh, spur at the uh, front edge of the acromion there, but the head is very round. There's no sclerotic changes at the tuberosity, no cystic changes. There's no, there's no significant spurring where the, at the acromiocavicular joint. Um, a minor little spurring where the coracoacromial ligaments, uh, or I'm sorry, coracoclavicular ligaments are, but, but that shouldn't have any effect on the, uh, on the uh, rotator cuff. So a healthy shoulder, uh, it's good to know, it means that there's probably not much in the way of any pre-existing situations. And so if he, if he does have a cuff tear, it's probably gonna be a pretty straightforward uh, procedure. The, um, on this particular x-ray, you're, you're seeing a little bit, you're seeing more cystic changes here, some sclerotic changes here, a little narrowing of the space between the two bones, a little more spurring here, a little spurring up here, still pretty good at the glenohumeral joint. But that's, another, that's an indicator that there's something that's been going on for a while, and for probably at least several years, if not longer. So it's just, it, should, it should pique your, your concerns as to whether you know, this is going to be a straightforward case or not. Um, then you get an x-ray like this, and you're, you're probably best not to start talking about uh, um, surgery. In this particular situation, the, the, the head is up against the acromion. The, um, uh, there's osteopenic changes of the humeral head. There's significant spurring at the acromiocavicular joint. Uh, if you can fix this, well, you can't. <laughs> so you're going to be in a situation here where you're, where you're best off therapy, uh, uh, expect limited, you know, limited function. Uh, if, it's, if it's a painful situation, it's not resolving your bait, then you're, you're starting to look at uh, things like uh, total, uh, shoulder arthroplasties, hemiarthroplasties, or reverse shoulders, where, uh, which actually play a pretty good role in, in, the, in the case of, uh, of a chronic uh, uh, large rotator cuff tear, but fortunately most of the uh, people you deal with hopefully aren't in that situation. Um, get to the MRI scans. The, uh, here you, there's um, the humeral head is in normal position in relationship to the glenoid, the, uh, the acromions. There's a normal space between the two. There is some tearing, interstitial tearing or mid-substance tearing here, um, but the tendon itself is pretty healthy looking and there's no evidence of tearing on this image. On the next image, you can see that there's uh, some uh, tearing of the inferior uh, aspect of the articular aspect of the tendon and more fluid in the, in the tendon itself. And so there's some splitting of the tendon here on this image. Uh, minor little impingement from the uh, chromioclavicular joint. The, um, on this particular image, these are the images that are most helpful for determining muscle atrophy and again, uh, likelihood of failure of a repair. The um, uh, supraspinatus is this muscle, and the cross section of the muscle is normal. Uh, the, uh, this doesn't reproduce, at least from my angle, it doesn't reproduce real well on the screen. But um, this is this is a healthy this is a healthy looking uh, supraspinatus muscle belly. If you get a if you get an image uh, like this where there's a lot of fatty tissue around it. The, the cross-section is diminished, and you have some uh, uh, increased signal in the middle, which indicates fatty infiltration. That's an indicator that the muscle's not functioning well, it's not going to function well. And, and, and it's not like, oh, send them to rehab and strengthen it. That, that's an indication that this muscle has not been used well for a fairly long time. Trying to, trying to get that to, to recover to a point of being functional is fairly, is fairly limited, in fact, perhaps nil. Um, again, uh, on this particular image, uh, humeral head's up against the, uh, the chromion. The tendon does actually still intact coming across here, but you can tell that this isn't functioning as a, as in a normal situation because it's not keeping the head down. Also, though, when you see this, you can infer that the biceps tendon, and there's other images which would show this, but the, the long head of the biceps tendon is also probably not, fun is probably torn as well because oftentimes, 
it's the, the, the rotator cuff can be torn and can have a fairly substantial tear and somebody may be functioning fairly well because the long head biceps tendon is still intact and, it's, and they've learned how to, to manage with, with that in, in place of the supraspinatus. And then what happens is they get a minor little injury, the, tear, the, the rotator cuff tears a little bit more or the biceps tendon gets frayed and then they all of a sudden have a profound weakness and, and, you, and you're wondering where did this come from and it's, you, it's because they've had something going on for quite a while and it just, and it just presented itself. Uh, on this particular image, uh, the head of the humerus still in, still in the normal alignment with the glenoid. You, the cuff is, re, is retracted to actually about here. Uh, uh, and then, um, but you still have a normal space. And so the biceps tendon is probably still functioning. This tendon is probably still repairable, still be able to be brought back into its attachment site here. Um, so that's, a, that's a, uh, probably a repairable tendon. Your, um, and this particular image, again, is similar to that x-ray. Heads up against the chromium. Cuff is retracted all the way to near the glenoid. Uh, and this won't, this won't be one that you can repair. You, this is what kind of one, depending on the age of the patient, where you might consider doing a reconstruction using a subscapularis transfer or a latissimus dorsi transfer, but those have varying results, and, and the latissimus dorsi transfer may be better, but, it, but it's got a significant, it's a significant amount of surgery and recovery time. So we talked about anatomic considerations, including whether, whether the, um, uh, the atrophy of the uh, supraspinatus muscle, long head tendon uh, being intact or not intact, um, open versus endoscopic repairs. Um, the long-term results, they're, they're equivalent. Um, the, um, the nice thing about the arthroscope is it's, it has shown us a great deal of information about what structures are are damaged in, in what kind of order and in what in what kind of uh, uh, sequences in terms of uh, uh, of um, the the whole spectrum of a, of an injury. So in the in the past we maybe only saw the inside of this when you had a full thickness tear and somebody couldn't raise their arm up and then you'd see it from from because you make a large uh, incision and you and you look inside. But we we were able to find subtle changes. In, in the tendons that are giving us an idea of the process, the, uh, the, 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 the chronicity of the, of, the act, of the injury. And so it's always appropriate now to do an arthroscopy of the shoulder uh, to look for uh, cartilage damage, to look for uh, tendon damage to the biceps, uh, also to, um, uh, to look for any labral pathology as well. The um, types of implants, there's, there's a as I use the word in my notes, which I can't see anymore, but the, there's a there's a plethora of of, of implants out there. It's, they, they keep coming. That you can use them in so many different ways, and and, and it's what it's is what's made the uh, arthroscopic approach so much better is that you have so many different types of implants and ways of placing suture, suture anchors, tying knots, doing knotless uh, procedures. So it it it's really been nice. It, it really makes our job a lot more. Uh, a lot easier and, and, uh, and, and also more um, uh, successful in, in, in what we're doing. Uh, single versus double row fixation. Um, in, in small tears, it hasn't been shown to make any difference. What a single row fixation is, is where you take one, you put an anchor, a suture anchor in the, um, and I, maybe I can back up here. You put a suture anchor in the tuberosity here, you bring the cuff back in place, and then you pass the sutures through the cuff and you tie some knots. Well, that, that works well for small tendons where it isn't pulled away very far. But if it's a, if it's a large tendon tear and it's pulled away, you're going to need both, you're going to need to have more support of the repair and of, the, of, the, of the bringing the tendon back into place. But also, as you rotate your shoulder during therapy, the, if you have only a single point of fixation, there's a lot of wind, windshield wiper movement of the tendon repair, and that can cause it to fail or to not heal as well. So in a, two row, in a, in a double row fixation, you basically put one anchor up near the here, you, actually maybe even two, but next side to side, and then you pass the sutures through the tendon. And then after you tie knots there, you, you bring the sutures over the end of the tendon here, and then you anchor them down there again. And that just reduces some of the windshield wiper movement of the tendon during the, after the repair is done. It's been shown in larger tears, though, to prevent refail, failure, and so it's, I think it's an important part of the, uh, of the, of the uh, planning uh, phase. Post-surgical rehabilitation. The hardest part about the post-surgical rehabilitation is probably the first two to four weeks when you're telling a person they can't do anything. 
and you and you try to. I remember my, my first patients uh, twenty uh, almost twenty years ago. I we were we were in the office and I and I'm and his his wife is saying, you know what, I can't get him to slow down and stop. And I'm saying, you know what, you need to keep your arm in that sling. I don't want you moving it. I don't want you bring your arm up and down. And he looks at me and says, you don't want me to do this? <laughs> that, was, that was the post-operative day one. So, so, you have, so there is this issue about communicating with your patients well beforehand. And it doesn't always work because they're not always listening to you anyways. And so you have to keep repeating it. And um, so I learned a lesson back then. Not all my patients have learned a lesson, but I've learned a lesson. Um, this is just a long slide I'm just going to go through real quick. The importance of this is that it, the, the attendant attachment is a fairly co complex attachment. And so it, it's, it's three zones. It's the tendon. It's where the, it's where the tendon kind of starts getting close to the, to the articular surface and the bone. And then it's the bone itself. And, and they all have to, to repair in, in, a, in a very in a very uh, precise way in order for the tendon to function well because it's, it's not just like uh, tying a rope to a post. It's got to absorb the contraction of the muscle. It has to absorb uh, the rotation of the, of, the, of the bone at the same time. So it's fairly complex. And, and it's, it's important from the standpoint of how you do the surgery, how you, how you recreate the tendon attachment, the footprint. It's important from when somebody's designing an augmentation device to try to, to improve the healing rate. It's important for them to know how, where, where normal cells are present, what types of cells are present there. But it's also important for, for rehab, rehabilitation because this whole process doesn't just, it isn't like six weeks and it's healed and you all know that. It's, it's not even like it's uh, three months or six months and it's all healed. It is year, literally, in almost all cases, a year of healing. Now, some people may be functional, may be performing very well at their activities by four to six months but they are not maximally healed until they get a year out, and, and there's a remodeling that occurs during that period of time that, that needs to be taken into account both in your, in your guidance for the patient and for, in, in guidance of therapy and all those types of things. So it's, it's not, just, it's not a, a simple attachment site, uh, and, it's, and, it's, a, and it's, a little more, it's more complex than just tying, uh, suturing two tendons together or two t that, have been torn, or that have been cut. So here's the, uh, a series of images of the, of the rotator cuff. Uh, this is just some mild fraying on the undersurface. Uh, it, you, you can get in here and you think, oh, wow, maybe this person doesn't need a repair, you know, because it's just mild fraying. So, you, you know, the head of the humerus looks pretty good. The bicep tendon looks pretty good. So then you get to the, out, the top side and, and you see this huge tear. Uh, this is probably about an inch in diameter here the, from the, where, the bone, where the tendon should attach on the bone. The, cu the cuff tendon splitting longitudinally as well, and it, it involves both the supraspinatus, which is the front half of, this, of the, of the ten two tendons that come over the top, and then the infraspinatus in the back. So, it, so you, get, you get a little bit uh, uh, kind of fooled into thinking maybe it's th these things aren't as bad as they look. And, and in this one, in particular, the MRI said a small tear. So you get there and you realize you're dealing with a, a bigger, uh, a more difficult situation. Uh, fortunately, in her case, it was a very supple tendon, and it was, it was easy to get the tendon leaf back where it belonged. Um, this particular image, uh, this, is, this is a more clear evidence of, of a partial undersurface tear, but it probably involves at least 50% of the thickness, uh, and I think probably closer to 70%. Again, biceps tendon's in healthy, and that's good. Humeral head cartilage is, is healthy, which is good. Um, this is now uh, a, a top side tear, bursal side tear, and, and you can see that here's the frayed edge of the, this is actually the frayed edge of the, of the remnant of the cuff on the, on the tuberosity, that's the bone, and then this is your cuff over here. Um, so in, t in tendon healing, as in all healing, there's three phases. There's the inflammatory phase, that's the part that lasts the first uh, you know, two, two to three days. It's probably the most important phase, though, not so much from, um, uh, from an injury uh, that's uh, scraping your skin, you know, getting a cut. It's, I mean, it's important, obviously, for that. But from a, re from a rotator cuff repair perspective, it's the most important part of the phase because how well the, 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 the blood vessels dilate, how well new blood flow comes into the area, how well the, the debris is cleaned up, it dictates how well everything else is going to happen from there. And so if you don't have a, a well-established uh, inflammatory stage where you have, where you have uh, good ingrowth or, or good migration of, of cells, 
everything else is going to kind of is going to be uh, limited and 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 compromised in in the rec in the healing process. The prol proliferative phase usually uh, it means the, you're getting more fibroblast uh, migration to the area. Um, immature scar remodeling phase is what it says up there. Collagen fibers are increasing. They're they're beginning to form along stress lines, and and uh, the whole process is is strengthening itself. Um, growth factors are released during this period of time. Um, the, the, as, I, as I mentioned a little earlier, um, angiogenesis, blood vessel formation, uh, capillary formation is probably the most important thing to occur. That's why smokers have a problem. That's why diabetics have a problem because they don't form good vascular supply. And if you don't have good vascular su supply, you're not going to have cells that can actually heal come into the area. And the, and the denser the cell population in the area of the injury at the, right after the, you know, within a couple of days after you've done the surgery is going to be the most predictive factor of how well things go. And so um, later, a little later on, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about stem cells, but ce every, you know, every person has cells that have what are called pluripotential cells, and these have the ability to, to, to change into different cell lines, and they can come, turn into fibroblasts or, or uh, or capillaries, form capillaries, uh, uh, muscle cells, bone cells. They have the ability to do that, but all of it is dependent upon their ability to get to the site of the injury and to continue to get to that site of injury, and that's where the, the formation of the blood vessels and blood flow is, is critical to this process. Time to go home yet? Um, so open versus endoscopic repairs, I already kind of mentioned all that. You just need to have... Um, yeah, do what do what you're comfortable with uh, from a surgical from a surgeon's point of view. Um, it depends on the available equipment. Uh, no significant difference between the two. Um, this is an example of a of a repair. That the, the tendon is here. There's some anchors here and here, and there's two anchors here and here. These sutures are the knots are tied here. Then the sutures are actually uh, in, embedded into the bone here, and it, you can see how it puckers the tendon. So it's a, you can tell it's a pretty good tight t repair. Not all of them will, sh will necessarily show up that way. It depends on the uh, quality of the tendon, but but it's a but it's a secure it's a secure um, repair. Now, if you can't get a tendon back down like this, or if the patient, for instance, happens to have risk factors for, for failing to heal, such as diabetic or, or smoker, or, then this is maybe the point in time when you might want to start thinking about augmentation. Um, so the, the, the first type of augmentation I'm going to talk about are these, are these, these graphs. They're acellular or extracellular matrix graphs. You, you may have heard of them. Um, the, um, they're, they're tissue that's taken either from, from cadavers, typically human uh, skin is treated, the, the cellular components are removed, you're left with just the matrix, the, co the collagen matrix is left, and then there's a few little other uh, uh, molecules that are called ground substance or proteoglycans that are there, and then there's also some growth, growth factors that are still remaining in the tissue, um, and, and th those can be used for, for repair. There's, there's human tissue. There's, um, there's uh, bovine tissue, um, I think that's a cow, and uh, por porcine, uh, uh, small intestine, submucosa, and then the small intestine um, uh, can be, cro that can also be cross-linked chemically after the processing or during the processing, which increases its, its uh, strength. Um, what's significant about the, or what's different about these, the graft jacket has been shown to have the greatest tensile strength so it does hold sutures probably better, but none of these none of these grafts actually are strong enough to bridge the repair site and take stress off of the repair site. Their their tensile strength isn't sufficient. So if the if the if the uh, if the sutures are going to fail or if the tendon's going to fail because of too much tension on it, this will the graft will already have failed. The uh, but what the graft does do is it allows for new cells. It does stimulate new cells to grow into an area, and it can help thicken the the tissue that in in the area of the rotator cuff to improve the, the strength of the repair ultimately once, once you've gotten perhaps uh, two to three months out, out from, the, from the surgery. The problem with the, um, the bovine and the, uh, the porcine, and particularly the restore graft, the problem with that is that they can't get rid of the D, a lot of the DNA that's in there from, from the animal itself, and so they tend, they tend to cause a lot, there tends to be more of an inflammatory response 
because of that. And there's also some concerns, though, that has, there hasn't been any known complications, but there's some concern about just DNA from a, from a, a xenograft being present and what effect it might have on, a, on an individual, uh, individual's body. The um, mechanism of interface regeneration, forget it. <laughs> I could get into it, but it, it's 4.30, isn't it? Or get, yeah, it's getting there. At any rate, <laughs> ideal stratified scaffold design. So what's out there now is they're trying to design synthetic graphs that use what's called nanofibers and nanoparticles, microscopic or those very small fibers that are, that are biodegradable, biocompatible, that actually can be strong enough to, withst to withstand the stresses applied to a tendon. They, they, allow, they allow for the um, population of that synthetic graft with uh, st stem cells. So you can place cells in there in various areas that, are, that actually may have already been actually uh, stimulated to be in different cell lines. So you could actually design it so that one end of that graft might actually have bone cells that are developing in the central aspect. You might have cells that are fibrochondrocyte Develop, uh, uh, developed, and then and then in the in the tendon portion, fibroblastic development. So it's kind of it's very it's very not necessarily on 4:30 in the afternoon, but it's very intriguing to see that some of this science being done, and so um, so I think that's where you, where you're going to see a lot of a lot of research is going to be di directed towards that. It's expensive, and so that obviously can can limit its application, but it but nonetheless it it. Um, it is, it is an exciting area of research. Um, so what would be the indications for the use of the graphs that we already have? Tissue loss, massive tears. Uh, unfortunately, those are also the ones that have the greatest failure rate. But the, and so it's been difficult to actually show that the graphs have been, have been working as well as they are purported to work. Um, the, uh, it'd, be, it'd be nice to have algorithms eventually that will t give us indications of what's the right patient to use it for. Um, those are still being developed and they're not, it's not clear yet either. Um, two two uh, studies that have been done in uh, not too distant future, Iannotti, or in the distant past, uh, Iannotti using the, por the, uh, the porcine um, uh, submucosa graft uh, demonstrated poor outcome, poorer, actually poorer outcomes than in the augmented group than in the control group. So, uh, and then they also had a 20% inflammatory uh, reaction rate in that study, so there was a fair amount of number of complications with the use of the graft. Wong in 2010 uh, used just used the graft jacket, which is, does not have the DNA issues. Um, he reported good results in 80 patients with these large tears. He didn't have a control group though, so we really don't know if they if they did any better than if they than if they had not used the graft. Um, Theories, okay, so moving on to platelet-rich plasma. Um, th theories of use, I'll get into a minute, indications for use, outcomes, future use. Um, how, how does platelet-rich plasma, how do they, how do they uh, acquire it? it? Basically, you draw blood from the patient. It can vary in volume from 30 to 60 cc's. Each, each system that's out there can use different ones, different volumes. But um, after you take the blood out, you put it in a centrifuge, you spin it down, somewhere between 1,500 and 1,900 uh, Gs of, uh, of uh, force. Um, it separates out the red blood cells from the white blood cells and platelets and from the plasma, or just the, non the acellular, non-cellular portion of the blood. Um, there's also uh, in, there's some proprietary th uh, developments in, in some of these systems which actually have a float that's in there which helps to compress the, the plasma and helps to imp or the platelets and helps to improve the concentration of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the, of the platelets. Um, the, um, after you spin it down, you, set, you pour off, the, you separate out the, uh, the, the blood cells and the, the red blood cells and the, um, and the plasma. And then you can, you can, at that point, decide of doing one of, one of two things. You can activate the clotting factors in, the, in that plasma, which will then kind of form a, like a jelly or uh, like, like uh, conglomerate. And then you can actually use that and place that in between the, uh, the tendon and the bone where you're doing the repair. Or you can, you can actually, it's, it's, it's actually thick enough to hold a stitch, not real well, but it can hold a stitch so you can suture it down to, it, to a tissue. Um, or in, in some situations where we're not using it for surgical solutions or, 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 or um, uh, treatments, 
if you're using it for more chronic inflammatory conditions, tendonitis of different whatever, um, you can you can uh, skip the clotting factor activation and just inject it, and then it's the exposure of that of that of that pl those platelets in plasma to the to the local tissues will actually stimulate a, a clot clotting a activity to form. It's just slower. But, but it's not important because it's not likely to spread around, which it will do if you're doing using it in, in a rotator cuff repair or, or an ACL tear or perhaps in an um, Achilles tendon repair or something like that. Um, the um, growth factors that are, pl are present in the platelet-rich plasma, um, uh, they're here. <laughs> the um, platelet-derived growth factor uh, stimulates cell replication, angiogenesis, mitogens for fibroblasts basically helps start cells dividing. Um, angiogenesis, again, of all the things in this, in these growth factors that I think is the most important thing, it isn't so much cell stimulation other than forming new blood vessels. If you can get that to occur, I think it's going to help you tremendously in terms of the ability for that to heal. Yes? I, I, Occasionally, not not very much. Uh, I can't, sometimes I'll use it if if somebody said comes to me and says, you know, we were we were at this doctor and he and he and, we, and he said that you really need to use this, and and it's a young girl and it's she's had an ACL tear and and the family says we really heard that this is great stuff, and I've succumbed. But but it's not because I didn't think it was useless, but I don't I don't use it regularly. Because in, in surgical situations, because I don't really know if it works. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> I told them that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we'll get to that in a, in a little bit. Um, you really don't want to hear about all these things. Angiogenesis, again, that's all I'll say. Um, so these are all the growth factors that are involved. Commercial product comparisons, hard to do. There some, some have different volumes. Some can, can concentrate it four to eight-fold. Some can concentrate it just a couple, you know, maybe two-fold. So there's some differences between the systems. Um, the, uh, so the factor concentrations, patient characteristics. You know, you know, we have, everybody has varying amounts of platelets. If you happen to be thrombocytopenic, low platelets, you concentrate, you know, 40,000, you get 160,000. Somebody else may have 350,000 per cc or per milliliter. Yeah, I think. Per milli uh, and, and so you're really not concentrating it that much. Yes? You should use your own. Yeah, because they're going to have the, uh, some of these, the same things if, with a blood transfusion reaction. They'll still have those kind of risk factors. So, yeah. Um, but that's what, that is what makes it attractive, though, too. The, the risk side of it's really low, other than I mean, if you do mess up with your prep, you know, your sterile prep or that kind of stuff, and you contaminate things, you can create an infection. But the and you might get some local inflammation by injecting too much volume into an area. But in a surgical situation here, where you've already you know been doing everything this you know to the tendon by you know with all the sutures and all this, this doesn't add any trauma to the to the situation. So you really have a there's minimal downside other than the time and and we'll get to the cost. Yeah. Um, so patient characteristics, there are some uh, indications for use. Uh, this is tongue in cheek, but like I said, if it, if it really worked and it, and you really, it wasn't that expensive and, it, and you got paid for it, you know, and, it, and all these other, you know, un, 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 unreal world things, you know, you, you could use it for everything. You know, you could, you could, moms could use it on their, uh, you know, and kids come in with a scrape on their knee. Yeah, you know, it, 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 but, but this is a little facetious, but it's, you know, it, if it worked, it'd be a, it'd be a great thing. Um, contraindications, thrombocytopenia, just because you're really maybe not concentrating things that well. Uh, a current anticoagulation therapy, relative contraindication. If you add, if you add, add, plate, if you add uh, calcium to the mix, it's not going to clot because you have anticoagulants there. But, um, but, uh, but other, other places, you know, but the obvious ones, you shouldn't use it in an active infection, but we're not going to be doing surgery in active infections. You, you, we don't know about tumors and metastatic disease, so we're just going to say, you know what, stay away from it. And, and pregnancies, I, I also try to stay away from operating pregnant women. Um, I'm, not a guy, I'm not an obstetrician. <laughs> um, so uh, platelet-rich plasma outcomes, uh, you can see them here, Randelli, 2011. And this is kind of why uh, I was talking about a year ago. I had one idea. You keep you know, you're going along. Well, there's a lot of stuff that keeps coming out 
month by month by month. Uh, they demonstrated some improved early recovery, which I think was that due to the fact you put these clotting factors there. You didn't have as much blood, f blood bleeding, so you probably didn't get as much adhesions, and so it just felt better. So that was probably part of it. But they didn't show any improvement in terms of retear re rates or failures. Um, Castrosini um, showed no improvement in small to medium tears at 16 months, no uh, change in, re in, uh, in failure rates or no difference in failure rates. Rodeo in 2011 also showed no significant difference. And then he just, just a month ago, his group came out with an uh, article in, I think it was American Journal of uh, Arthroscopy or something, where um, saying that it actually might impede, grow impede healing. Now, why would growth factors impede healing? Well, it's not the growth factors, but unfortunately, when you have the platelet, when you have this platelet-rich plasma, you can't get rid of the leukocytes because they're in the same bunch, and the leukocytes have these enzymes which actually break down tissue because that's what they're normally designed to do. When you have an injury, they're released; they kind of cl clean up messes. But if they're interfering, if they're causing more tissue damage. Then, then, it's, then maybe you're not really achieving you know, uh, what you want, especially because they are now concentrated. Um, so future uses, where are we at? Not clear. Non-surgical uses. Of all the things, that this actually may be a, a role for this stuff because um, lateral epicondylitis, Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, they, there are some, for, at least for lateral epicondylitis, there are some surgical techniques. They actually work pretty well when somebody gets to that point after a year or two where they're tired of it. They actually do work. But if, if you can avoid doing the surgery and, and you can use this as an injection in the office, it's great. And, and there has been you know, studies that have shown that to be effective at a year, 18 months afterwards. So I think these, these three things I mentioned up here and a few others are still reasonable situations that, for these to be considered. Um, Patient-specific, maybe, maybe if you have somebody with diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, smoker, maybe it's worth still trying and seeing if it, if it works better. Because we do know that smokers are t have, a, have a terrible time at getting these, these uh, things to heal, whether it's Achilles repairs, whether it's fracture healing. So, so maybe there's a role there still, but it's not clear what that role is. Um, so what's the cost of uncertainty? Um, does anybody have an idea of what an acellular tissue matrix cost is? Anybody want to guess? So a piece that's this big, that big, how much? 20? Okay, fortunately it's not that costly, but it's, but it's, it's per center, square centimeters, you're talking somewhere like around one to $200 for the cost to the hospital. But so a, a graft, three by four graft uh, from some of the vendors is $1,000. And, and, the, and the cost of something like the graft jacket, somewhere between uh, $2,000 and, and $4,000. The charges to the patient from the hospital, mm -hmm. I, I call up just because I was curious, um, and f for the smallest graft was $5,800, $17,000, so that's why you were pretty close, $17,000 for the, for the charges to the patient for those grafts. Um, <laughs> I guess that's why we buy clothes where we do sometimes too, right? <laughs> I like clothes. <laughs> um, so, at any rate, um, so that's so with platelet-rich plasma, um, surgical uses they charge for the sp for the centrifuge to bring it in. They charge for the kit that's this little tube that separates that lets you separate out the elements of the blood. Uh, Three to five thousand dollars for that. Um, in the office, it's a thousand dollar charge for that, plus you know, plus um, uh, whatever you charge for injection for the injection for drawing the blood. So obviously, these things have huge costs. And if it's for, I'm not sure if it's going to make a difference. You know, the question is, why are we doing it? And so it it's um, it's out there. We 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 still need to still need to find out. You know, where to go with this. What, how much time do you have? Am I already over my limit? No. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I know this is such a beautiful day out there. So what's next? Um, I talked about this a little bit. Embryonic stem cells, adult mesenchymal cells, um, the embryonic stem cells, um, the benefit, uh, indefinite proliferative period, so they, they have a, a, their shelf life is much longer, differentiation to, for different cell lines. They have it for, almost all, for all cell lines. Uh, however, they, they, they are not your own tissue. They uh, can incite an immune response. 
Uh, they're tumor tumorogenic, meaning they can cause tumors to form. And then a, a big one is the ethical concerns of, of how they're acquired. And um, so fortunately, uh, adult mesenchymal stem cells have been shown to have to be uh, uh, effective in, in, in animal models. And, and so that's, that's great because they don't, the uh, preliminary studies show them to have, some, have good p potential. Uh, there is, e there's an ease of acquisition. Um, there, it avoids immune response concerns, and, and then there's the absence of ethical issues. Um, ease of acquisition is relative. There's two types of these stem cells. There's the uh, bone marrow-derived stem cells, and there's the adipose-derived stem cells. Bone marrow, obviously, means you just have to stick somebody typically on the, you know, through the iliac crest. Uh, it doesn't hurt when they're asleep. It hurts when they're awake. Um, but, but, it's, but it's one way. But the problem with that is it's hard to get a lot of cells. You don't know how many you're going to get. And, and so, it, it, so it's a little unpredictable and it's difficult to acquire. Adipose cells, in this country, there's a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and just sorry, I shouldn't digress like that. <laughs> but fortunately, we all have some. And they're, they're not hard to acquire. And it's, hard, and it's good. You can get a fair number of them. So, so it's, a good, it's a good potential source for, for treatment. <laughs> so the conclusions are patient selection, um, it's key. It doesn't matter. All the augmentations in the world, they're, they're, they're still limited. And, and, you, and you have to choose what, what, you know, your patients well and, be and have good preoperative planning. But you also, not only good preoperative planning, you have to know what your patient, who he is, who she is, how motivated they are, how compliant they are, what's the other risk factors. Surgical technique, there's no augmentation, there's no supplementation that makes up for poor surgical technique. So you have to, you have to pay attention to the details. Um, proper rehabilitation, both before the therapist, after the therapist. There's lots of protocols out there. There's also lots of, lots of therapists, and there's also a lot of different types of patients. You have to have frequent post-op visits, because if you don't see them regularly, you're not going to be able to, to see what the therapist is doing. You're not going to see if the protocol is being ad addressed the way you want it to. And even protocols have to be changed in, by, by the individual characteristics of the patient. And you have to pay attention to what the patient's doing as well. So it's, it's, imp it's important to have a lot of uh, post-op visits. And then augmentation. you know. We'll see. It, right now, I, I'm, I'm not very uh, gung ho about the you know, surgical use of the, ev either the ones I mentioned there. Um, there. There are other things like allografts, but you know, just strictly tissue grafts, but uh, that are not that are um, that are um, not what, what I've talked about here. But th those haven't shown to be, be very effective. So it still remains to be seen what what's going to happen with the augmentation. But uh, presently, it's it's really not uh, um, well understood. So thank you.